I'm what you would call a collector of bootleg Pokemon games. Pokemon Diamond and Jade, Chaos Black, etc. It's amazing the frequency with which you can find them at pawn shops, or will, flea markets, and such. They're generally fun, even if they are unplayable, which they often are. The mistranslations and the poor quality make them unintentionally humorous. I've been able to find most of the ones I've played online, but there's one that I haven't seen any mention of. I bought at a flea market about five years ago. Here's a picture of the cartridge in case anyone recognizes it. Unfortunately, when I moved two years ago, I lost the game, so I can't provide you with screen caps. Sorry. The game started with the familiar Nita Reno and Gengar intro of Red and Blue version. However, the press start screen had been altered. Red was there, but the Pokemon did not cycle through. It also said Black version under the Pokemon logo. Upon selecting new game, the game started the Professor Oak speech, but it quickly became evident that the game was essentially a Pokemon Red version. After selecting your starter, if you looked at your Pokemon, you had in addition to Bulbasaur, Charmander, or Squirtle another Pokemon, Ghost. The Pokemon was level 1. It had the sprite of the ghosts that are encountered in Lavender Tower before obtaining the Silph Scope. It had one attack, Curse. I know that there is a real move named Curse, but the attack did not exist in Generation 1, so it appears to be hacked in. Defending Pokemon were unable to attack Ghost. It would only say that they were too scared to move. When the move Curse was used in battle, the screen would then cut to black. The cry of the defending Pokemon would be heard, but it was distorted. It played at a much lower pitch than normal. The battle screen would then reappear, and the defending Pokemon would be gone. If used in battle against a trainer, and the Pokeballs representing their Pokemon would appear in the corner, they would have one fewer Pokeball. The implication is that the Pokemon had died. What's even stranger is that after defeating the trainer and seeing Red receive $200 for winning, the battle commands would appear again. If you selected Run, the battle would end as it normally does. You could also select Curse. If you did, upon returning to the overworld, the trainer's sprite would be gone. After leaving and re-entering the area, the spot where the trainer had been would be replaced with a tombstone like the one the Lavender Tower. The move Curse was not usable in all instances. It would fail against Ghost Pokemon. It would also fail if it was used against trainers you would have to face again, such as your rival or Giovanni. It was usable in your final battle against them, however. I figured this was the gimmick of the game, allowing me to use the previously uncapturable ghost. And because the curse made the game so easy, I essentially used it throughout the whole adventure. The game changed quite a bit after defeating the game. After viewing the Hall of Fame, which consisted of ghosts and a couple of Pokemon I used for each end, the screen cut black. The box appeared with the words, many years later, then cut to Lavender Town. An old man was standing with me with two students. He then realized this man was your character. The man moved at only half of your normal walking speed. You no longer had any Pokemon with you, not even Ghost. So up to this point, it had been impossible to remove from your party through depositing in the PC. The overworld was entirely empty. There were no people at all. There were still the tombstones of the trainers that you had his curse on, however. You could go pretty much anywhere in the overworld at this point, so your movement was limited by the fact that you had no Pokemon to use hidden machines. And regardless of where you went, the music of Lavender Town continued on in the loop. After wandering for a while, I found that if you go through Diglett's Cave, one of the cuttable bushes that normally blocks the path on the other side is no longer there, allowing you to advance and return to Pallet Town. Upon entering your house, and going to the exact tile where you start the game, the screen would cut black. Then a sprite of a caterpie appeared. It was then replaced by a weedle and a pigeon. I soon realized, as the Pokemon progressed from Rapta to Blastoise, these were all the Pokemon that I had used personally. After the end of my rival's team, a youngster appeared, and then a bug catcher. These were the trainers I had cursed. Throughout the sequence, the Lavender Town music was playing, but it was slowly decreasing in pitch. 
By the time the arrival appeared on screen, it was a little more than a demonic world. Another touch of black. A few moments later, the battle screen suddenly appeared. Your trainer sprite was now that of an old man. The same one as the one who teaches you to catch Pokemon in Guardian City. The ghost appeared on the other side along with the words, the ghost wants to fight. You couldn't use items and you had no Pokemon. If you tried to run, you couldn't escape. The only option was fight. Using fight would immediately cause you to use struggle, which didn't affect Ghost, but did chip off a bit of your old HP. When it was Ghost's turn to attack, you would simply say, Pop off that. Eventually, when your HP reached a critical point, Ghost would finally use Curse. The screen cut to black final time. Regardless of the buttons you pressed, you were permanently stuck in this black screen. At this point, the only thing you could do was turn the Game Boy off. When you played again, new game was the only option. The game had erased the file. I played through this hack game many, many times, and every time the game ended with a sequence. Several times I didn't use Ghost at all, but he was impossible to remove from the party. In these cases, it did not show any Pokemon or trainers, and simply cut to the climactic battle with Ghost. I'm not sure what the motives were behind the creator of this hack. It wasn't widely distributed, so it was presumably not for monetary gain. It was very well done for a bootleg. It seems he was trying to convey a message, though it seems that I am the sole receiver of this message. I'm not entirely sure what it was. The inevitability of death? The pointlessness of it? Perhaps he was simply trying to morbidly inject death and darkness into a children's game. Regardless, this children's game has made me think.